Um, hi everyone, welcome to this late, late session on Android accessibility. Thanks for coming. Um, this talk is aimed at people who um, might have some knowledge about accessibility already. Um, maybe you've had some uh, feedback from others about best practices, tips and tricks, but now that you're looking for a structured approach on how you can actually um, start including this sort of thing in your apps, um, how you can begin and how you can move forward um, with real world examples. Um, I've been doing accessibility on Android since 2015, starting on um, a newspaper app called The Times and Sunday Times. Um, since then, I've moved on to another product called Channel 4, which is similar to um, Arta? Arta in Berlin or some TV on demand app. Um, and what's really nice is seeing over the last three years or four years, meetup organizers and conference committees accepting and um, considering accessibility talks or talks about inclusive design. Like I think we had uh, Mitchell in the front row yesterday speaking yesterday at the bar camp about accessibility, um, which is cool. And since around 2016, because of all this um, content, all this exposure, there's been lots more teaching content as well. So lots of more, more people with, with uh, more speakers and more blog posts who are introduced to accessibility, um, which is cool. So a few people took up this sort of accessibility mantle, championing inclusive design within their teams um, and companies. And while it's useful to have a single person or an enthusiastic supporter or expert around, having one person is not sustainable for the product because you need the whole team on board. So like, you, you can't fight against the car and imagine if you get hit by a bus or something. And I think one of the things that we need to think, well, one of the things we need to address is that we're moving too quickly or we're, we're producing content which is shallow in, in, uh, in our investigations or research. Um, so you get lots of tips, lots of tricks and best practices, but it's kind of overwhelming because you don't know what to begin with, you don't know what to start with. Um, and how you can move forward and actually make a difference in, uh, in the experience for your users. So you get people who leave the talks and who read the blog posts and they think, oh, okay, accessibility is a good thing to do, but where do I start? There's no framework and no real context to apply changes. So I ask the community, what's, what do they need? What's stopping you from implementing what you've already learned in your apps? And they replied. So I got lots of varied responses. Um, a few of the responses were surprising because there was a lot more um, experience that I didn't expect. Um, people were asking about um, advanced topics, like how can they integrate um, these accessibility checks with their continuous integration systems? Like how can they prevent regressions from occurring after they've um, added support? Some were asking for tooling help, like is there anything that we could do to improve the automated testing? But the majority of people were asking for um, help on getting started, something practical like a guide, um, kind of like a migration of how you can take your app as it is now, assess it, and then move forward. Um, but it's kind of a big task. Um, what, what do you do first? Um, you could do, have code samples like the architecture blueprints. Um, you could have videos and guides on how users with disabilities actually use Android so you can see firsthand um, how your app is um, being used, or what the pain points are. Do different people have different habits? Do different people have different patterns or preferences, even if they've been labeled with the same disability? And there should be some sort of addressing of trade-off between the design and developer effort to the actual um, the returns on that investment. And how can you convince the business to spend time and money on it? So my goal for this year, so it's, I guess halfway through the year, so this is um, a bit slow, but it's to answer this question, answer these questions, provide these sorts of um, guides and structured um, ways to move forward, answer questions, give feedback, and get feedback as well. So still understand what people are struggling with, um, produce samples and docs and tools to help testing. What I want is for people to feel confident to approaching inclusive design head on. And my 15 minute goal, um, because I don't have a year, is to present as part of this effort. And I'll begin by explaining what I think accessibility is. If you have learned about accessibility before, could you give me a little nod or a hand in the air? Cool, so it's a lot of, a lot of room. Just forget everything you've learned before. 
Not because it's wrong, not because um, I think I know better, but because I think it's nice if we all start from the same page, we all um, have a shared understanding of what we think an accessible app is and does. Um, and for me, that means two things. Every, every single app does two things. One, it presents information to the user, and two, it provides a way for the user to interact with the app. And our job as developers, designers, product owners, assessors, et cetera, is to facilitate this for as many users as possible. And this facilitation for as many users as possible is what accessibility is. To do that, we need to know our app. So we need input from our product owners. We need input from our designers. Um, everything that you do needs to be done with intent. So any sort of information or action that you want to um, show to your users needs to be prioritized and sorted so you're not overloading um, the user with too much information. And since there's been requests for non-trivial examples, let's use YouTube as a real world example. So we'll um, highlight this as a, we'll highlight the things that YouTube does well because it's, I'm not using it as an example of things that um, aren't performed well. Um, but one of the cool things about using this app is that it uses a lot of the widgets that we use in our day to day. So it uses rec recycler views, it uses uh, images, um, it uses <laughs> text views, etc. But it also uses widgets that we don't necessarily encounter day to day, like video, um, which provides um, this app with affordances for other avenues to present information. We'll highlight things it does well, and we'll also look at the opportunities to approach some things differently. And then by the end, hopefully, we've got a set of actionable steps or checklists that you can work through. And we'll cover two topics, because I think now I've got 10 minutes left. But for me, these ones make the biggest impact. So they might seem simple or trivial, but um, in general, they're the things that are going to have the biggest returns for, as, for a lot of users. The first thing we're going to start to talk about is text. Text needs to be one thing only, and that's readable. If it's not readable, then there's no point having it on the screen. And it's our responsibility as developers, as designers, as product owners to ensure that readability. One of the hardest things that we have to do is design for dynamic content. So we don't know necessarily when we're getting strings from, the, um, from a remote API room locally how long it's going to be. Even for content that we do know, so stuff that we package inside the APK, translations, different screen sizes, it means that there, there's going to be varied lengths, so we can't know at design time. There's a few ways to solve this. You can use a fully responsive layout, which we've been introduced to from day one with um, dimensions um, like um, wrap content. You could also truncate the text. Um, you've probably tried doing this by adding ellipses if the text extends too far. Or you could have some sort of combination where you might display a, um, an abridged version of the text uh, showing like a summary, but then have some affordance that takes the user to see the full, the full length. And the YouTube app demonstrates all of these techniques. On the home screen, um, here we've got each of the item widths which match the device width, but the item height is unconstrained. Because the list is vertically scrollable, it means that the items can grow as large as needed, and so if the video titles are long or, you know, novel-like, um, it doesn't matter. The view is going to extend as much as needed, and the titles will just wrap. But there's also cases where width and height constraints are necessary, um, potentially because you're trying to maximize the amount of content that you're trying to fit on the screen. In these cases, where you've got fixed um, size views, it means that sometimes text needs to be ellipsized. You can't fit um, as much text as you want inside. You can't extend the view, so you need to indicate that it's an intentional choice for you to ellipsize or truncate the text. Um, but this isn't enough. Um, if this is the only place where you can read this text, then it's important that, well, one, we've lost uh, sight of our original goal, which was to make text readable. So what can this ellipsize mean? It doesn't, does it need to be bad? No. Ellipses can serve as a subtle call to action. Um, some sort of like a click here for the full story. So when you click on the, the text, the ellipsoid text in the uh, video list, it takes you to the video detail where you can expand or you can see the video titles in full. You can expand to see the um, descriptions as well. The descriptions. So I don't know how often people are 
surfing on YouTube, but people like to fill out the descriptions a lot. Like, the platform is for video, but people like to write a lot. In this example, the user needs to click on the title to see expanded content. Um, but it's not only the descriptions that are made visible, um, the subscriber and the views format changes. So things aren't abbreviated anymore. You can see things in a long form content. But you still need to be careful. Even in the cases where um, you've got more space, remember to check for the cases where text might be unintentionally cut off. In this case, where we're ellipsizing the um, subscriber count, the, te the information here is important, but not necessarily when you click through to the next, the next page of the video um, details page. Here, maybe we could have done wrap content instead. And if you're lucky enough to have 5 million subscribers, um, then maybe it's OK for the subscribers where to be on the next line. And sometimes it's better to hide these elements entirely rather than to show them partially obscured. The good news is, if you can handle this sort of varying text length already, the next step is easy. The next step is about um, supporting uh, different font scales. So you, you should use scale-dependent pixels, so SPs, where, where this unit is useful. The user is able to change the font scale at a system level, and our app should respect that. Doing this correctly, for me, is the biggest impact you can have in terms of supporting vision-impaired users, um, because it means, well, for me, this is the easiest way your app can break. So you increase the text size because you can't read something um, from the normal reading distance, and then suddenly all the layouts break. You get ellipsized um, text. You get overlapping text. It's diff well, worst case scenario, you can't read stuff. Best case scenario, it looks ugly. And there's two parts of um, what this means for doing it correctly. First, use SPs instead of DPs so that the system can apply that um, size transformation for you. And secondly, make sure that as the text size increases, text size isn't cut off, so that whole last section I talked about. The user is not able to pick whatever size they like. Um, in my testing, I found that there's, there's four scaling factors, at least on the Pixel phones, which range from 0 0.8 to 1.3. Mitchell told me just before the talk that also the OEMs can change these or provide different options, so he's seen it at 1.5. Um, so the testing doesn't need to be to the extremes, you can test up to, for example, 1.5 or up to 2, um, and it's enough. To make that easier, the testing easier, we wrote a JUnit rule to help. So as part of your espresso tests, you might be using activity test rules. Activity test rules work in that when your espresso tests start running, your activity spins up, and then after your test finishes, it's, it um, tears down. So what, we, what can we do? We can combine this. You can combine multiple test rules to with a rule chain. Um, and one of the rules that we created at Nevada was the font, font scale rule. So in this case, where the font scale rule wraps the activity test rule, the font size on the device will be changed um, to begin with. Then your activity will spin up, so it's already at the correct size. Then your test will run, the activity will tear down, and then the font size will be reset to the original value. This isn't so useful because it's kind of hard to detect um, when your layouts break. But if you combine it with other test rules, like the screenshot um, test rule, I think you can get, I think Facebook has one for sure. Um, there's other um, ones available. Uh, you can use it to, f to speed up all the manual testing that you have to do. I'm going to skip past this next section about making your text color considerate. There's two main points to consider, really. It's don't convey information with color only, like provide some other affordance, um, like making it bold or underlined, um, and making sure that you test the color contrast ratio as well to make sure that whatever text or icon, iconography that you have is distinct enough from the background to be um, readable. So in this case, you've got that gray background behind the play controls. So no matter what the image is behind, no matter what the video is, you can still see the controls. And a structured guide to accessibility on Android would be kind of incomplete without mentioning accessibility services. So an accessibility service, hands up, no one? Cool, so maybe the one that you will be most familiar with is TalkBack. Um, it's a software implementation of an assistive technology. It acts as a screen reader. So it's used by vision impaired users um, so they can 
read what content is on the screen. And it also acts as an interaction helper as well. So the users can use gestures like swiping and double tapping to um, interact with the widgets on their phone. So it still does those two things that we mentioned at, at the beginning. It conveys information to the user and it provides affordances for them to interact. So TalkBack is the most um, familiar one. With TalkBack, users can navigate through elements on the screen sequentially. Um, double tapping on the, anywhere on the screen will send a click event to whatever's focused. When I was collecting feedback, someone asked what makes a good content description. Um, a content description is um, a metadata that's assigned to the view. It is readable by any accessibility service, and TalkBack will use it um, as the spoken description for whatever view is focused. Um, so what makes a good content description? A good content description describes what a view is and nothing more. So you don't necessarily need to say that it's a button or an image. You can describe, describe it. Um, I think Samsung tried to push really hard for all the buttons to be labeled as buttons, which is why you might see that um, in some of the Samsung apps or maybe further. But now we've got uh, usage, usage hints. So it's enough to say um, that what the view represents. So here we've got YouTube and search rather than uh, YouTube logo and magnifying glass. But how do you describe these uh, actions? So in this case, we've got a view group. Our view group here contains quite a bit of information and it's not just, so it's not just individual views that need content descriptions. If you set the description on a complex view group, then it means that you're telling TalkBack explicitly what you want it to say. Otherwise, it's going to try and concatenate the description from the elements inside, which might be too verbose. So that's something that you need to talk to your product owner about and your designers about. How do you specify the action? If you're just describing what the view is, how do you say what happens when you interact with the view? So you can use usage hints. Usage hints are available from, um, I think, API 16, but you can customize them from API 21. These are um, if a view ha is actionable, for example, if it's clickable or long clickable, um, TalkBack will read the description out loud and then it will pause for a second and then follow by the hint. So in this case, it says double tap to play the video. By default, it will say double tap to activate or double tap and hold to long press, but these aren't helpful. So you can customize them. The way you do that is use an accessibility delegate. You can add additional metadata about the view to the accessibility node info objects, where here we're, specify, we're um, specifying that the click action is associated with the play video label. Or if you're using Android KTX, you can use this extension function to set usage hints. Um, and that's pretty much it. So if you're after a base level of support for TalkBack users, t content descriptions and usage hints. But we're not after a base level. We're looking to raise the bar. Since we saw that users navigate sequentially with touch-based gestures, um, can we improve that? So if, imagine you've got a, um, a long list of items. The user's going to need to swipe a lot to get through um, each item. Instead of having three clickable areas per item, we can have one. This means that you only need a single gesture to um, navigate. But you can't just get rid of actions and reduce the functionality, because that's not making it accessible. That's making it less accessible. Instead, so when a user clicks on an item, we can display all of the actions in a dialog, like a bottom sheet. Doing this across the app, wherever we're looking to simplify view groups, will lead to a consistent user experience um, for TalkBack users and also keyboard users or switch access users. You can, again, use the accessibility delegate if you want to expose these to the power users or for accessibility um, services. Here, you just need to override another method on perform accessibility action um, wh where you call back to your listener. To make it easier to implement this and the dialog stuff without duplicating code, you can use accessibility tools from Nevada. Here, we can use um, a menu resource um, to um, inflate a menu and then set that as your accessibility delegate. Finally, you can also add actions to the UI where necessary. So consider the video controls overlay, which usually disappears after a few seconds. If TalkBack is enabled, um, YouTube avoids the timed auto-dismiss, so you can change behavior. 
um, it adds an explicit dismiss button to the overlay, so it stays on the screen until the user explicitly dismisses it. Uh, in addition, because the seat bar controls are fiddly to use with TalkBack, there's additional rewind and forward buttons available. So that was a really quick introduction to accessibility in Android, what you can do today to start um, implementing it in your app. Um, there's the stuff about making your text readable, using, uh, making sure that your content is, your layouts are responsive so that you're not cutting off content unintentionally, making sure that your text is scalable so that it respects the user's preferences, making sure that the color is chosen, colors are chosen considerately so that you're supporting users with, um, that have difficulty with low color contrast. And then finally with um, talkback users as well, making sure that you're improving the navigation and uh, providing good content descriptions. If you have more questions, I am around today and tomorrow. Um, otherwise, Nevada are hiring. Um, thank you. Thank you, Atoll. Uh, we have five minutes for questions. You have two microphones in the middle. Or you can ping me directly outside anywhere. Someone found my email somewhere, so they did that. That's okay as well. Cool, thank you.